station. This is Isa Piao from the National Space Center in Leicester. How do you hear me? Hello, everyone at the National Space Center in Leicester. This is the International Space Station, and I hear you loud and clear. Great to see you, Tim. I leave now the floor to Ono Ajam. Hello, Tim. Welcome again from Leicester, obviously home of the National Space Center. We have hundreds of members of the public here and students. But of course, for us, it's a really exciting time because Leicester is home of the Premiership Champions in, in 2016. Hi, Anu. Yeah, yeah, you guys have certainly got an awful lot to celebrate down there. And uh, it's great joining you uh, today in Leicester. Tim, I'm, I'm delighted that we have this opportunity. I, I know that time is tight. Um, one of the first things I just wanted to thank you for, I, I've got on stage with me here, uh, I've got a, a high-altitude pressure suit, and, and I've also got the backup flight kit for the experiments you did for us, because from the National Space Academy's perspective, we'd like to thank you for doing those experiments. And from FAI's perspective, for aeronautics and astronautics, we'd like to thank you for the inspiration you've been giving to, to students across the United Kingdom. It's a great opportunity for us, and I'd just like to start with, with, with looking at five months into your mission, Tim. Um, as somebody who started as a, as, a, as a test pilot and has now become an astronaut, how did you find that change from aeronautics to astronautics? Do you know, it's a good question, Anu, and it's been an incredible experience, a fascinating journey. And I've been amazed at the, the transition and actually how easy the transition has been. There are so many things that I have learned uh, being a, a pilot uh, and an instructor pilot and then a test pilot. I think in particular, coming from the aviation community, you bring an awful lot to, uh, to being an astronaut. Many of the things that we deal with here in space are very similar to things that we're used to dealing with in the aviation industry. And certainly I approach my job here as an astronaut still with my test pilot's head on. Um, everything we do up here, it's cutting edge technology. We're developing new systems. We're new, using new materials. We're coming up with new techniques. And in order to improve and to move forward, it's good to have that kind of test pilot mentality. Tim, one of FAI's most prestigious awards is the Komarov Diploma, which this year We've just announced it's been awarded to two of your, your former crewmates on the space station, Scott Kelly and Mikhail Kornienko, for their completion of the year in space mission. Um, I just wondered if you'd share your thoughts on, on this, this long-duration space flight and how important it is if, if we're ultimately going to go to Mars. Yeah, I'm absolutely delighted for Scott and Mikhail to, uh, to uh, receive that uh, very well-deserved honor. And it was a huge privilege for me to serve on board the space station under Scott's uh, leadership and with Mikhail as well. They were both excellent crewmates and really taught me an awful lot. And one of the things that struck me you know, spending the last kind of three months of their one-year mission was just how good they were in terms of uh, obviously uh, being extremely professional, but also in great physical shape, um, great mental shape as well. And it really just proved to me that, of course, we can live and work in space for as long as we need to. These missions that we're working on to, to, to Mars, uh, the human element, the human physiology element, uh, I think we've nailed it. We really have. And we've got lots of techniques now as to how to deal with living in microgravity We've still got some technical challenges to overcome, and, and we're working on those. But it really is, you know, the next steps to the moon, to Mars and beyond are well within our reach. And that's hugely exciting. Tim, I want to take this opportunity now to hand over to some students uh, who've got some questions for you. Hi, Tim. Uh, my name is Thomas from Robert Gordon's College, Aberdeen. And my question is, following the chip in the cupola, have you personally seen any space debris, and how problematic is it? 
Hi, Thomas. Yeah, I, you know, I should have pointed out that chip in the cupola window was there when I first arrived. But having said that, of course, the space station does get struck by micrometeorites um, and, and they, they can't be tracked, really. They're too small to be tracked. But we have lots of um, mechanisms on the space station to protect us from those small pieces of debris. Um, we don't actually see any of the debris up here. And actually, when I when I look out the cupola window as well, it's very hard even to see other satellites. But when I look back at the videos that I've taken, and the time-lapse photographs, I can see satellites uh, moving around in the, uh, in the sky. So um, in terms of being able to visibly see debris, no, we can't. But we can see the impact that debris has had on the space station. Thank you, Tim. And now for our next question. Hi, Tim. My name is Adam Mogherow, and I'm from, I'm from Castellan High School. My question is, which has been your favourite experiment and why? That's a, a good question, um, although it's a tough one for me to answer because, um, you know, five months into the mission now, we're, we're well, in, well, well over 200 experiments down for Expedition 46 and 47. Some of the ex more exciting ones have been the ones that we have a lot of practical interest in as well. For example, the airway monitoring experiment, the first time we used the space station's airlock as a hyperbaric chamber, investigating our own airway inflammation and using nitric oxide as an indicator for that. So some groundbreaking techniques there that will help people on earth who suffer from asthma um, so that that really for me was a very exciting experiment to, to be involved in um, and also uh, things such as flame combustion experiments as well it's fascinating to see how uh, the flames perform in microgravity Tim just for launch there was a, a great shout out for you from Mellor Primary School here in Leicester just down the road and so the next question is from one of their students. Hi Tim, my name is Shreya and I'm from Mellor Community Primary School and my question to you is, which is more beautiful, daytime earth or nighttime earth? Hi, Freya. Uh, got another difficult question to answer because they're both stunning. Um, some of the things I love at the nighttime are thunderstorms and the aurora. And we've really been quite lucky. The, the, we had a lot of solar activity during this uh, mission. And I thought I wouldn't see that much of the aurora, but we've been spoiled. I, I see it more often than not. Um, and also the aurora australis, which is, is beautiful and, and just as powerful and as stunning as the aurora borealis. Um, and in, by daytime, of course, we we get to see all of the beautiful places that we recognize on Earth. And, and I, I take lots of photos in the daytime and at nighttime, and they're both absolutely stunning. Thank you. And we have a, another student question. Hello, Tim. My name is Asia from Mellor Community Primary School. And my question for you is, what exercises do you do to keep fit in space? Yes, keeping fit in space is really important um, so that we can uh, prepare ourselves for coming back and living on Earth in a 1G one, one environment. So we tend to exercise for about two hours every day, and that's a mixture of cardiovascular exercise. So we'll either jump on the running machine or on the bike machine to get our heart rate up and to give our heart muscle a good workout. And then we'll also exercise on a device we call A-RED, which is, uses vacuum cylinders to give us uh, some weight resistance so we can do muscle training. Training. Tim, F FAI is all about setting records. My next question is from somebody who I think has already set a record as the youngest person ever to fly in a vertical wind tunnel. It's Noah Montgomery, and he is going to be four in two days' time. So I think we're setting a record for an in-flight call age here. So, Noah, what's your question to Tim, please? Um, if he has a telescope. So Noah has asked me this question many times. Does Tim have a telescope like the one I've got, or is it better? No, uh, that's a great question. I think you're obviously well on the way to being uh, a great adventurer and explorer and astronaut with, uh, you know, with your wind tunnel achievements. Um, in terms of a telescope in space, we don't have a telescope, but we do have um, several pairs of binoculars, which are stabilized so that we can use them for some astronomy as well as looking at the Earth. 
and some of our cameras have some really large lenses on them uh, and so we can kind of see down to a very fine detail we can al almost see something as small as your house or your garden through those uh, t through those camera lenses so uh, no telescopes but plenty of optics to help us look at the stars and to look at earth Tim, we've also had a question from one of our Facebook uh, Facebook likers at the National Space Centre website. It's from Declan Proud, and he wanted to know, how does it feel to inspire so many children and adults getting into STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math subjects, w w with what he's called the Tim Peake effect, because it, it's been so clear here. Oh, you know, Anu, it's, uh, it's a good question, and I set out um, on this uh, journey, if you like, before the mission. I, I just had an objective of wanting to share it as much with everybody as possible. Um, you know, in the UK, since Helen Sharman's flight, which is uh, almost exactly 25 years ago, she celebrates that anniversary this weekend, um, the UK hasn't had much to do with human spaceflight, and it's a, a rare opportunity. So I, I wanted to try and share this mission as much as possible with everybody, and to try and help inspire our next generation of, of young scientists and engineers that there is a real great benefit of getting involved in STEM subjects right now that will set you up for a very exciting future. And uh, I'm just absolutely delighted that, that this mission seems to have had that effect and uh, I couldn't have asked for it to go any better. That ties in nicely with another question we had on Facebook from, from Kat Evans. You, you've answered the first part of her question about uh, advice for being an astronaut, but she also asked, what's the hardest thing about being in space and, and what's been the best thing? Um, gosh, good questions. The hardest thing about being in space, um, well, I think, you know, being separated from friends and family, really, from a, a kind of an emotional point of view, that's obviously difficult being up here for long periods of time. Um, from a, an actual sort of operational perspective, the hardest thing about being in space is not losing stuff. Uh, it's very easy to let go, and as soon as you let go of something, it just drifts away, and, uh, and actually, they can move fairly quickly, and you look back a couple of minutes later, and it's not there, and you've lost it. So, Keeping track of everything is probably the hardest thing about being in space. Oh, sorry, the, the second part of that question, Anu, uh, what's the best thing about being in space? Um, it has to be the, the view of planet Earth. I mean, I thought that um, after maybe a month, two months, three months, you would go to the cupola windows, look down, and uh, you know, you, you'd have kind of seen it all before and you'd get used to it. It's something that I never get used to. There's always something exciting, something different, something beautiful to see outside the window. It's hugely addictive. And uh, the more you look at planet Earth, Earth, the more you start seeing its secrets being revealed to you. Tim, I know we've only got about a minute or so left, but that ties in with the last question from all of us, which is really with five months into your mission gone and, and a month before you return to Earth, I mean, what are your thoughts going into this final month and, and how have your perspectives changed over the last five months? Because for us on the ground, it's been absolutely inspirational. It'd be interesting to get your perspective. Yes, you know, I mean, from an operational point of view, we just treat every day the same up here. You have to be very focused. Uh, there's a lot of work still left to do. Um, you have to obviously always be ready for uh, any eventualities, any, any off-nominal situations that may happen. So uh, I know I'm going back in four weeks' time, but I don't really think about that. I just kind of take every day as it comes and focus on what the next main task is. Uh, but uh, over the main, over the five months, looking back on the mission, um, it has just been hugely rewarding. It's been an incredible incredible privilege to live and work on board the space station. Uh, the science has been amazing, the spacewalk was a real highlight, uh, and things like uh, capturing visiting vehicles, the Dragon spacecraft as well, a real highlight. Um, and I think it won't really be until I get back to Earth that I'll actually have time to reflect on just how amazing the mission has been. Well, Tim, we're going to be celebrating your return to Earth with a launch party here, and I know that's going to be replicated across the United Kingdom. And I know that speaking to colleagues uh, in many other countries, that they have been as inspired uh, as we have by your mission. So I'd like to finish in truly British style with uh, three cheers for Tim. Hip it! Hip it! Hip it! 
And a round of applause as well, please. <laughs> Thank you so much, Anu, and thank you to everybody at the National Space Centre in Leicester. It's been a, a real honour to be speaking to you this afternoon. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you very much indeed, and have a great day. Station, this is Houston and ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you.